Amen. If you would, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, as we are starting a new series titled Abide, and we are going to be looking at the farewell discourse. And so, John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, uh, those chapters comprise what is known as Jesus' farewell discourse to his disciples. So kind of set the the stage for us, everything thus far in the book of John, in the gospel, has portrayed Jesus' public ministry, all right? So Jesus has been very public in his ministry uh, until you get to chapter 13. Chapter 13, there's a transition. Jesus transitions from public street ministry to private ministry. In home ministry, Jesus is no longer seeking just to reach the Jews. As a matter of fact, he's turned his focus to the world and he is preparing his disciples for his departure. Jesus is getting ready to be handed over, to be betrayed, and to be crucified. And he is saying farewell to his disciples, but this is what I expect of you in my absence. The same thing could be said about us. We too are Christ's disciples and there, uh, and there are certain things or there is a certain way that we are to live. We are to live our lives under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Everything in our life ought to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this, and, and, and to be quite honest, for the Christian This should not be something that's hard to find. If you are truly saved and truly seeking to abide in Christ like all true believers should, then the evidence of your Christian faith is going to be made manifest in how you talk, how you handle yourself, how you address other people. So as you think about your life today, are you right now laying a legacy of lordship are you laying such a foundation in your life right now that says Jesus is Lord because you're either doing one of two things you're either laying a legacy if you're a believer or you're preparing to leave a legacy for those of us who may we don't really know how many years of life we have left only God knows that Some of you may outlive me, I may outlive some of you, we don't know, but what we do know is this, is that when it's all said and done, people ought to be able to look at our lives and say, that man or that woman knew Jesus as Lord. Because you can see the Lordship of Christ all over his life, all over her life. And the way they treated one another, the way they raised their children, the way they handled their finances the way they handled the Word of God, the way they came to church. You ought to be able to look at a person and say that person is laying a foundation in order to leave a legacy of lordship. And one of the great examples that I think that we all can see quite clearly is the example that was left for us by the Cruz family, especially Dr. Cruz, and I know Miss Cruz wouldn't want me saying anything, but I'm going to anyway because, uh, but because he's the best illustration I have as far as what it means to lay and to leave a legacy of lordship. When you look at Dr. Cruz's life, it was obvious that he loved the Lord, and not only did he love the Lord, but it was obvious that Christ indeed was his Lord. He lived under the lordship of Christ. And one of the things that Dr. Cruz and I talked about on a couple of occasions was the fact that he wanted to lay, he wanted to leave a legacy. Something that continues to minister to people even after he's gone. He wanted to lay and leave a legacy of lordship. And he did just that. We have our counseling center over here because of a man who was willing to lay and to leave a legacy of lordship. And now think about all the people who will be ministered through that and who are being ministered through that. All because someone had a vision 
for taking what God had blessed them with and putting it under his feet. Saying, you are Lord. My mind is yours. My heart is yours. My faith is yours. My wife is yours. My children are yours. My finances is yours. My house is yours. Everything that I have, God, and all that I am is yours. And I place it under your feet. Jesus is going to show his disciples in chapter 13 exactly what it looks like to lay and to leave a legacy of lordship. Look with, there with me just for a moment. Chapter 13, verse 1. The Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own. Now notice that. Notice what John is saying about Jesus. First of all, Jesus knew. You see this in verse 1. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world. That means that Jesus knew about his impending death. He knew about the crucifixion. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And enduring supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus knowing, there it is, we see it again. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Notice what Jesus knows just from the beginning. Jesus knows that he is about to be handed over, betrayed, crucified. But he also knows he has all authority in heaven and earth. Now think about that for a moment. He knows he's about to be betrayed, arrested, crucified. That's the first no that we see in this passage. Jesus knew that his hour was coming. The second knowing is what? Is that he has all authority. Which means that he knows he can stop this whole thing if he wants to. Which means that he has all power and all authority to stop the betrayal, to stop the arrest, to stop the scourging, to stop the crucifixion. He had all authority to do that. But he didn't. He willingly submitted to the cross. Look there, verse 3 again. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Now, this is very important. I want you to underline a few things for me. Verse 4, I want you to underline rose from supper. This is, these are all key words. He rose from supper. The second thing I want you to underline is he laid aside. And then the third thing I want you to underline is he took a towel and he tied it around his waist. Those are all theologically uh, deep. And each one of those statements foreshadows Christ's work of redemption. I'll show you that before the sermon's over. How Jesus rising up from supper, laying aside his garments, taking a towel, tying it around his waist, bending down and washing the feet of the disciples. In that act, Jesus was portraying or he was giving them a foreshadowing of the cross. Jesus is showing them the whole purpose for which he came. And then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he, and he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do not wash my feet. In other words, Lord, that's, that's the role for a, a servant. That's the role for the lowest servant. Uh, Lord, don't wash my feet. That's beneath you. And Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. What was it that he didn't understand? Jesus was showing Peter that cleansing only comes through Christ and that Christ must go to the cross. He must die. Why? Because the only way for Peter to be cleansed of his sin was for Christ to shed his blood. And now Christ is illustrating that very truth before them by washing 
their feet. Jesus says, listen, you don't understand, but you will later. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. In other words, Lord, I want to be with you. Uh, then wash me all over then. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed you does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. Are you clean, but not every one of you is. Now I want you to notice this. Jesus says, when I touch you, that's all you need. You don't need me to wash your whole body, you understand? Because I've already washed your feet. Jesus is saying, one touch of my grace cleanses the whole man. Jesus is saying to all of us who are saved, if indeed you have trusted in me, then when I touched you, all your sins were forgiven. You don't have to keep on being washed and washed and washed. I have washed you. You are forgiven. Now, he also knows that not all of them are clean. He knows that Judas is there and that Judas is not clean. He knows that Judas is preparing to betray him. Verse 11, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet, now notice this, underline this. He put on his outer garment. Earlier he took it off. Now he puts on his outer garment and he resumes his place. And he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you, for I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, that you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Well, there's a couple of things that we see here in this passage. Three things in particular that Jesus is modeling for us. So here's my challenge for us this morning. We too, indeed, if you are saved, we too are Jesus' disciples. That word disciples is just the Greek word mathetes. It means to be a learner. One who follows and learns from. So indeed, if you are saved, then you are to be following and learning from Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. I'm following, I'm learning, I'm a methetes. Notice the setting. The Bible said it was before the feast of the Passover. So the meal that they are celebrating is not the Passover meal. It's a meal in preparation for the Passover, so it's just a regular meal. And back then, of course, they would find a small room with a large table, and they would sit on the floor around the table. And that's the picture that we get here. Here are all Jesus and his disciples sitting in the small room. They're all gathered around the table. Jesus, is, Jesus knows what's going down. He knows that Judas is going to betray him. He knows it's necessary for Judas to betray him because that is what's going to start his move towards the cross. So Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to depart. I want you to notice how John, the portrait that John paints of Jesus first. Notice how he presents Jesus to us. You'll see this in verse 1. He says, first of all, you need to know something. He says, you need to know that Jesus knew his hour was coming. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that this was the moment 
of his betrayal that would ultimately leave or lead to his crucifixion. Jesus, Jesus knew that. But the hour had come for him to depart out of the world to the Father. And look at this. And, ha- and how did he live his life while he was here? He loved his own. He loved his own. Jesus knew. Jesus loved. And then he goes, he loved his own who were in the world. And he loved them what? To the end. When, when, when you back up in John, you learn a little bit about the love of God that's represented to us. We, we know this verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We see that when God loves, he loves the world. And when God gives, he gives his son. And when God loves, he loves forever. So we look at this passage of scripture and the author, the narrator, John, is pointing or painting a portrait of Jesus as the one who has all knowledge and the one who is full of love and the one who loves to the end. That's what John is saying about Jesus. And then he's not finished because look at what he says in verse 3. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand. So Jesus is, he knows about the cross. Jesus knows he has all authority, all power. Jesus loves and he loves to the end. So you would expect when you see this beautiful picture of Christ, You would expect for the disciples to bow down and to worship him. You would expect the disciples to bow down and want to wash his feet. But that's not what happens. You have this high and exalted view of Christ here in this passage. He is indeed the Son of God who spoke the world into existence. And took on human flesh and came into this world. And he knew why he came. He knew he would come to die. But yet he loved. And he loved his own to the end. And he had all power and all authority that he could have stopped anything at any time. But the very next thing that we see is the king of glory doing what? Rising up from supper, laying aside his outer garment, taking a towel, tied it around his waist, and then he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. I don't know if you'll remember when the American forces actually invaded Iraq. One of the things that the uh, soldiers did was they pulled down the big statue of Saddam Hussein. Do you remember that? And when they pulled that statue down, there were many people who lived in the city who took their shoes off and they started beating that statue with their shoes. And that was a symbol of disgrace and shame. We're shaming you. We're hitting you with the bottom of our disgusting shoes. And they beat that statue, shaming it. That culture understands dirty feet. And they understand the shame that comes along with dirty feet. And they even have methods of shaming people by their dirty feet. But what does the king of all glory do? Steps out of eternity into time. Lays aside his royal garments. Rises up from the throne. Steps out of eternity into time. Clothes himself in human flesh. And he served. If you want to lay or leave a legacy of lordship, the first thing you need to do is to, is to learn the lesson of walking in the light of Christ's love. 
We must walk in the light of the love of Christ. We see that here. Jesus chose love. Judas chooses betrayal. And as a matter of fact, you have that juxtaposition here or a contrast between Jesus, Jesus and Judas. John paints Jesus as the highest. Jesus is the one with all authority. He's the one who loves. He's the one who loves to the end. He's the one who knows what's about to go down. In other words, Jesus is the high and exalted one. But in the narrative, the exalted one lowers himself. Whereas the one who's the lowest exalts himself. So you have Jesus who is the highest humbling himself. And you have Judas who is the lowest exalting himself. One is a faithful picture of love and the other is not. And if we are going to lay and leave a legacy of lordship then we too must learn to walk in the light of Christ's love. We must love one another. The love of God is is manifested. The love of God is to be manifested. God manifested his love to us by sending his own son. Without Christ, we would have little understanding of the love of God. But God has manifested his love to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, through our own salvation and the forgiveness of sin. And God says, I've manifested my love to you, and now you need to manifest that same love to one another. If you want to lay and leave a legacy of lordship, then make sure that your life is characterized by manifested love. Love is, the love of God was not only manifested, it's magnetic. When people see the love of God, they're drawn to it. They're drawn to people who walk in the love of Christ. So learn to walk in the light of Christ's love. Manifest it. Realize it's magnetic. It will draw people. And let me tell you thirdly, the love of God is majestic. There's nothing like it. It changes lives. We look at, it changes cultures, it changes nations. Listen, we all know that there's enough grumbling and hating in this world. And if we are not careful, we as the Christian church will grumble and complain and murmur just like the rest of our society. And then there's no difference between those who are lost and those of us who are saved When we all make the same noises and we all say the same words and we all do the same things, we as Christians are held to a higher standard. We will be held to a stricter judgment, especially those of us who preach and teach the Word of God. So it is vitally important that if we want to honor Christ as we anticipate His return, then we must walk in the light of Christ's love. We must love one another to the fullest extent. We must love one another to the end, just like Jesus. Not only should we learn the lesson of walking in Christ's love, we should learn the lessons of Christ's humility. Humility, I mean... Really, I I would say to you that what God wants us to really get out of this passage, and you'll see that in the weeks to come, is that God really wants us to love one another. He does. I mean, it's really the whole purpose of the gospel. It's that we love God, we love our neighbor, and true love obeys love. The Bible is a love book. God wants us to love those created in the image of God. God wants us to Love one another. Well, how do we do that? How can I truly show you love? By humbling myself. And, And considering you more important than me. 
And not only looking after my interests, because I have to do that, but also to look after your interests. That's what Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 2, verse 1. He said, if there's any love, any fellowship of love, you know, re- then join with me in rejoicing. But, but we see here, if we're going to love this way, we've got to humble ourselves. And where do we see the humility of Christ at? Well, the Bible says that the one who has all authority, the one who loved to the end, rose up from supper. He rose up from the table. And he laid aside his outer garments. And taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin. And he began to wash the disciples' feet. And to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. So we see the, the utter humiliation of Christ. Or the utter, utter humility of Christ. That Christ who spoke the world into existence and placed each star in its place, upholds all things by the might of his right hand. But yet he humbles himself to wash the feet of his own sinful creation. Now, he didn't create them sinful. He created man innocent. And man chose to rebel against God. And after Adam's fall, all of mankind has rebelled against God. So that's what I mean when I say, here we see the King of glory who is completely without sin and perfectly holy. And what does he do? He kneels down to wash the nasty feet of sinners. And this isn't the first time that Christ humbled himself. Christ humbled himself through the incarnation itself. God placing himself in a womb. That's that's humility. And then we see the humility of Christ in his infancy. And the fact that he had to be cared for by mom and dad He was relying upon them for food and clothing. So we see the humiliation of Christ in the incarnation. We see it in his infancy. We see it in the time that he was born. We see the the humiliation of Christ in his life as well. The one who gave the law came and obeyed the law. The one who owns all things chose poverty. No place to lay his head. The one who is perfectly holy chose to hang out with sinners. So we see the humiliation of Christ in his incarnation, in his infancy. We see it in his life, but we also see it in his death. We see Christ being humbled by willingly submitting to the temptations of the devil. God could have, Jesus could have taken Satan and slung him around like a pit bull does a stuffed, a stuffed animal. He could have tore all the stuffing out of the devil if he wanted to. But he didn't. He subjected himself to Satan's temptation. And Christ went through all this humiliation. Death, even death on the cross. He went through all this humiliation. And why does he tell you? Why? Well, primarily for our salvation, but also to give us an example to follow. So if we look at this and we say, okay, I want to lay and leave a legacy of lordship, then what does that look like? You need to learn to walk in the light of his love. I mean, every single day, all the time. Walk in his love. Secondly, learn the lessons of his humility. There was nothing that Christ wasn't willing to do. Whatever needed to be done, he was willing to do it. When it came to the gospel and advancing the kingdom, Jesus gave all. And he even gave his own life. And he expects nothing less from us. Nothing less. He expects us to live our lives in the fullness of his love. 
loving him, loving our neighbor, loving one another. And he expects us to walk in humility, to consider others more important than ourselves, to be willing to do what's ever needed to help somebody, even washing feet of dirty men. I think I, I've told this story a couple of times from this platform, but I can remember one time, Pastor Alfred, when I was in Bangladesh. I can't think of the area that we were in, but it was a, a, a um, it was one of the areas they told us not to go to, but we went anyway. And when I got out of the the, the rickshaw, I had sandals on, and when I got out of the rickshaw. Uh, the sewage there had backed up. And so when I got out, I stepped in all the, you know, the sewage, the sewage on the street. And I looked down at my feet, and I, and I had this disgusting look on my face. And out of nowhere, this man comes running up to me. Ne out of nowhere. I don't know him. He don't know me. But he's got a towel wrapped around his waist, and he washes my feet. And he gets up and he walks away. I have never forgotten that. And there's a lot of things I have forgotten. But I have not forgotten that gentleman's loving, humble act of service towards me. And that's the way the Lord would have us to live. That we would humbly love one another. And we would do that through tangible acts of service. Just like we see in this passage. Which brings me to my third point, And then we'll be done. Is that we need to learn the lesson. Of following the likeness of Christ's service. Walk in the light of his love. Learn the lessons of his humility. And follow the likeness of his service. Serve like him, like Jesus did. Isn't that what he tells us? The Bible says, Simon Peter, we talked about that. He missed it. He didn't understand, but then he submitted. Look at verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments, he resumed his place. And he said, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You ought to love each other. Humbly serve each other. That's what he's talking about. For I have given you an example. You see that? Not a church ordinance. Some people make this into a church ordinance. It's not a church ordinance. It's an example. He says, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done. Now really, what's he after? The act of love and the act of humility. He says, I've given you this example. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, here they are, beloved, blessed are you, notice the condition, if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. What? Love with humility, serving God and others. Love, humility, and service. That's how we lay and le leave a legacy of lordship. Is that we love, is that we humble ourselves, and we serve other people. Jesus says, this is the example I've given you, and blessed are you if you do them. So, the, the teaching is straightforward. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand. 
is we hear messages about love and humility and service. And that's what our lives are to look like. That's how we are to live as we anticipate Christ's return. But here's the issue. You can't do it. Only Christ in you can. So if you leave here thinking today, I've got to try harder, you've missed it. What I want you to see is what Jesus says in John chapter 15, which we'll get to in a few weeks. But Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So the key to loving and the key to humility and serving is abiding. Stop trying to live the Christian life and start letting Jesus live it through you. And the way that Jesus lives it through you is that you abide in Him. And as you abide in Him on an ever-growing, ever-increasing ever so intimate level, as you grow in abiding in Him, then love and humility and service are not things that you try to do. They become you. So the goal is to be so filled up with Him, so in love with Him, that love and humility and service just ooze out of us. Wherever we go. And if that's not where you are, well, that's what we need to pray for. I conclude with this. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This is the corresponding passage to John 13. Now, remember in John 13, Jesus got up from supper. He laid aside his garments. He put on a towel. And he washed their feet. And then after he completed that task, he got back up and resumed what? His previous position. Does that sound anything like the incarnation, the cross, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? Absolutely. Jesus is showing them that in John 13. Jesus is saying, listen, brothers, this is why I came. I came... For this reason, just like I rose up from supper, I rose up from the throne. And just how I laid aside my garments, for a time, I laid aside my glory. And just like I take this towel and tie it around my waist, I have become a servant to all mankind. And just as Jesus bent down to wash the disciples' feet, in the same way, he went to the cross and died for the salvation of mankind. And just as Jesus got back up after he washed their feet and resumed his place at the table, come on now, three days later, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and rules and reigns at the right-hand throne of God even now. You want to see, yeah, amen, go ahead. You want to see Paul's version of John 13? Here's Paul's version, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. He says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he rose up from supper. Oh, I'm sorry. He emptied himself. And he tied a, he tied a towel around his waist. Oh, no. It says, but, but taking on the form of a servant. And being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed upon him a name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what's my exhortation for all of us today? Abide in him. Abide in Him. Abide in Him. I was talking to someone yesterday 
And I said, there's a lot of talk out there today about porn brain. You know, guys who or girls who watch a lot of pornography, and then next thing you know, their brain starts getting rewired, and they can't think straight. And I mean, they just get, and their brains just get messed up. I told this guy, I said, you know what? You can. There's such thing as porn brain, but there's also such thing as a God brain. And the reason you have porn brain is because you're feeding your brain porn. You're looking at it all the time. If you stop doing that and you start feeding it this, guess what? You're going to move from porn brain to Bible brain. We must abide. Abide in Him. As Paul tells us, so that we might shine like stars in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Thank you, Jesus, right? For humbling yourself. Dying in our place. And rising from the dead. Thank you for such humility and such love and such service. And now would you pray in turn, Lord, help me to abide. So that I can lay and leave a legacy that says that you are Lord in every aspect of my life. Help me to abide so that I can be a light that shines in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Here on a moment, I want to ask you to stand and the altars will be open for you to come and pray. But there's others in here and you may need salvation. You've never come to Christ and genuinely been saved. Well, here in a moment, when I ask you to stand, you come up to me or one of the other pastors and let us pray with you. Come and give your life to Christ today. Father, we commit this time to you right now in Jesus' name. Would you stand and come as the Lord leads you come? Hey, we want to say thank you for checking us out on YouTube. Thank you for listening to the sermon. And if you have any questions about the content of that sermon or even about salvation, uh, please contact us on the website that's listed there on the screen. We would love to hear from you, also be able to speak with you, and perhaps even answer any questions that you may have. God bless. Keep tuning in.